Yeah.
wasn't right there.
The subcommittee will come to order. Thank you for your patience. Welcome everyone to today's hearing on the Department of Defense's policy and programs for countering weapons of mass destruction for fiscal year 2019. Almost one year ago, we met to discuss this same topic amidst news of Syria's repeated use of chemical agents and North Korea's advancements in nuclear weapons, as well as their asymmetric use of nerve agent for political assassination. In the year between, reports have surfaced of North Korea's biological weapons program and their regular transfer of chemical weapons technology to Syria. We have also seen Russia's attempted use of a military-grade nerve agent in support of their ongoing political assassination campaigns. Needless to say, a lot has happened in just a year. The pursuit and potential use of weapons of mass destruction remains a high consequence threat to our national security. Thankfully, we have not seen any use, domest any use domestically, but we must not take this for granted. As the past few years have shown, the use of WMD is unfortunately becoming more and more commonplace. Low barriers, and in some cases, no barriers to entry, should force us to continually review and evaluate our programs, policies, and activities designed to counter and mitigate these threats across the WMD spectrum from state and non-state actors alike. From an adversarial standpoint, I am particularly concerned about advancements being made in the areas of synthetic tech biology and biotechnology. China and Russia continue to pursue gene editing and unique approaches to biotechnology that should give us all tremendous pause. With respect to non-state threats, some analysts say that the potential for a single undetected terrorist group to develop and deploy first seen engineered pathogens has never been higher. And as this subcommittee has discussed before, synthetic biology and gene editing, when combined with high performance computing and access to large scale genetic data sets, has the potential to redefine biological threats as we know them today. With all of this in mind, we can understand the importance of today's hearing. We have before us four distinguished witnesses. From my left, Mr. Ken Rapuano, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense and Global Security. Mr. Guy Roberts, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense Programs. Mr. Vale Oxford, Director of the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. And Lieutenant General Joseph Osterman, Deputy Commander of U.S. Special Operations Command. I would now like to take a moment to recognize Ranking Member Jim Landman for his opening remarks. Thank you, Chairwoman Stefanik, uh, and thanks to our witnesses for being here uh, today uh, to provide testimony on the Department of Defense's strategy, policy programs, and preparedness for countering weapons of mass destruction and the fiscal year 2019 CWMD budget request. In 2014, the Department released its strategy for CWMD, which outlined three end states that no new actors possess WMD, that there be no WMD use, and that should WMD be used, that there be a minimization of their effects with associated objectives and lines of effort. The strategy notes that fiscal, year, fiscal constraints require the DOD make strategic choices and accept some risk. However, increasingly bold rogue actors and technological advances are challenging the strategy's goal of ensuring that the U.S and its allies and partners are not attacked or coerced by adversaries possessing WMD. For example, earlier this month, we witnessed a peacetime chemical weapons attack in the United Kingdom in an assassination attempt on one of Russia's former military intelligence officers. This attack on one of our closest allies, perpetrated by Vladimir Putin, demands a strong and unequivocal response, which is why I introduced bipartisan House Resolution 786 last week in condemnation of this attack in support of our allies. In Syria, pro-regime forces and ISIL consider the use of chemical weapons on civil civilian populations as advantageous to achieving tactical and strategic objectives. Technological advancements, especially in biotech, as Chairwoman Stefanik has uh, referred to, may allow individuals with nefarious intent or simply by chance uh, to produce biological agents in a scope and scale not yet encountered. Since the strategy was released, the Department has taken some initial steps to strengthen CW, CWMD efforts. In 2017, Special Operations Command was designated as the coordinating authority for CWMD. Today, we'll hear from Lieutenant General Osterman and Deputy Command, uh, the Deputy Commander of SOCOM about how the command is leveraging best practices 
from its traditional missions and from lessons learned in its role as CA for, for countering violent extremism to reinvigorating CWND awareness, planning capacity, and capability across the DOD and the interagency. The witnesses also include Assistant Secretary of Defense Ken Cap Rapuano and ASD Guy Roberts, as well as Director Vale Oxford from the Defense, Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Together, these individuals hold positions that comprise the bulk of assigned roles and responsibilities associated with aligning CWMD policy uh, to strategy and programs, executing CWMD programs, and delivering uh, current and future uh, personal uh, protective equipment and other CWMD capabilities to our warfighters. Since the last hearing on this topic, the department has reorganized the split of the Undersecretary for Acquisition Technology and Logistics into two entities serves as both an opportunity and also a potential area of risk to the CWMD effort. There must be, we, there must continue to be coordination within uh, all elements of the Office of Secretary of Defense on this front, including with the Undersecretary of Defense Research and Engineering. There must also be continued focus on and prioritization of CWMD by all those uh, with assigned roles and responsibilities. In closing, there's much work to be done to strengthen the CWMD policy programs and preparedness. This includes understanding the 2014 strategy in the context of today's threat landscape, the budget request alignment to the current strategy, and understanding how DOD strategy and end states are consistent with the national level strategy and whole of government effort. With that, I want to thank our witnesses again for appearing uh, before us today. I look forward to your testimony, and with that, I yield back. Thank you, Jim. And just a reminder to our members today and witnesses, immediately following this open hearing, we will move next door to a closed classified roundtable. Thank you again to our witnesses for being here. And Assistant Secretary Rapuano, we'll start with you for your opening remarks. Thank you, Chairwoman Stefanik, Ranking Member Langevin, and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here today to testify with three of my esteemed colleagues about the Department of Defense's efforts to counter weapons of mass destruction. The Honorable Guy Roberts, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense Programs, Lieutenant General Jody Osterman, Deputy Commander of U.S. Special Operations Command, and Mr. Vale Oxford, the Director of the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. The four of us, the Joint Staff, the combatant commands and other DOD components work closely together to ensure the department prioritizes its efforts and fully leverages DOD's unique authorities, resources, and capabilities to protect the nation. As Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense and Global Security, I am the Secretary's primary advisor on CWMD strategy and policies. The United States faces a range of complex and multidimensional WMD challenges. Chief among these are North Korea's dangerous and provocative testing of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles, the continued use of chemical weapons by the Syrian regime and ISIS, China's expansion of its strategic nuclear force, Russia's recent provocative statements regarding nuclear strike capabilities and their likely responsibility for the attempted assassination of a former Russian spy in Britain using a highly lethal nerve agent. And technological advances lowering barriers to entry for a range of adversaries around the world. We maintain unique capabilities to address these and other WMD threats and achieve the national defense strategy objective to dissuade, prevent and deter adversaries from acquiring, proliferating, or using weapons of mass destruction. We enable a more lethal and resilient force by degrading WMD threats, modernizing key CWMD capabilities, and ensuring the department's policies and plans comprehensively account for WMD threats. DOD's strategic approach to the countering WMD mission focuses on three lines of effort, preventing acquisition, containing and reducing threats, and when necessary, responding to crises. DOD seeks to prevent acquisition of WMD through the Department's Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, or CTR, by working in over 30 countries to build capacity to detect, secure, or eliminate WMD and pathogens of security concern. In addition, to prevent the transfer of WMD or dual-use materials 
The Department works closely with interagency partners to build partner capacity and to spread an understanding of international norms and obligations through the Proliferation Security Initiative. To contain and reduce threats already developed, the Department maintains specialized plans and capabilities to isolate, identify, neutralize, and dispose of WMD threats before they can reach our borders. DOD also continues to support State Department-led efforts to work with international allies and partners to hold the Assad regime accountable for using chemical weapons and will continue to ensure the President has all the options available to respond as necessary. The U.S. and our coalition partners continue to exploit opportunities on the ground to better understand and disrupt ISIS CW networks. Ultimately, should deterrence or efforts to contain and reduce threats fail and an adversary attacks us, the Department of Defense's top military priority is to respond and prevent future attacks. DOD safeguards the force and ensures personnel can sustain effective operations in contaminated environments to guarantee DOD's warfighting capabilities. Using the unique Section 333 authority granted last year, DOD improves partnerships and alliances by training and equipping partner nations to conduct CWMD operations. DOD also has a wide range of domestic CBRN response elements and continuously trains and exercises to employ these capabilities, which can be used to support civil authorities to help save and sustain lives in the aftermath of a domestic CBRN incident. The complexity of this mission area requires a whole of government approach and strong unity of effort. In alignment with the Secretary's prioritization of defense reform, we cooperate closely with other U.S. departments and agencies and our allies and partners. We rigorously prioritize the application of our roles, responsibilities, and capabilities to focus on countering the most operationally significant WMD risks to achieve the most security impact for the nation. And we are bringing together DOD CWMD stakeholders to ensure a common prioritization of threats and objectives. As WMD-related challenges continue to emerge, your continued support for the Department and the efforts described today are critical to our ability to understand, anticipate, and mitigate these threats. Thank you. We'll have to take the rest Thank for the you. record. The time's expired. Assistant Secretary Roberts, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Stefanik, Ranking uh, Member Lang Langevin, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I certainly appreciate this opportunity to testify on the Department's efforts to counter threats posed by weapons of mass destruction. In the interest of time, I provided a written statement for the record. I simply aim to highlight for you here a few key aspects about the organization I am charged to lead, the enduring and emerging weapons of mass destruction challenges our forces face, and what the Department is doing to address them. As the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense Programs, I am responsible for advising the Secretary of Defense on nuclear weapons, nuclear energy, and chemical and biological defense matters. Further, on behalf of the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment, our office also oversees the modernization of our nuclear forces and the development of the Department's capabilities to counter weapons of mass destruction threats. NCB is comprised of a workforce that includes the offices of nuclear matters, chemical and biological defense programs, and threat reduction and arms control, as well as the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Together, we ensure that our nuclear deterrent is safe, secure, and effective. We take proactive steps to reduce and eliminate known WMD threats, and we develop capabilities to protect the lethality of our forces against the myriad of WMD threats they may face should deterrence fail. State efforts to modernize, develop, or acquire WMD in their delivery systems constitute a major threat to the security of the United States, our deployed troops, and allies. In recent years, both state and non-state actors have used chemical weapons against civilians, such as in Iraq and Syria by ISIS and the Assad regime. Further, Russia's recently reported use of a military-grade nerve agent in the UK constitutes the first offensive use of a nerve agent in Europe since World War II. Biological and chemical materials and technologies, almost always dual use, move easily in the globalized economy, as do personnel with the scientific expertise to design and use them, both for legitimate and illegitimate purposes. We're just beginning to grasp the implications of the accelerating diffusion of these technologies and materials. 
Perhaps most significantly, however, China and Russia are accelerating the modernization and expansion of their nuclear forces, among other things, in an effort to reduce the influence of the United States, gain veto authority over other nations' economic, diplomatic, and security decisions, and ultimately shape a world consistent with their authoritarian model to gain advantage. NCB's top objective is, in alignment with the national defense strategy is to dissuade, prevent, or deter state adversaries and violent extremist organizations from acquiring, proliferating, or using WMD. Our nuclear forces make essential contributions to the deterrence of nuclear and non-nuclear aggression, as well as non-proliferation. Our nuclear forces not only deter a nuclear attack of any scale, but by extending nuclear guarantees to our allies, we lessen their incentive to develop nuclear weapons on their own, thereby supporting U.S. non-proliferation goals. WMD threat reduction programs executed by DITRA continue to reduce the threat of WMD around the world by detecting and preventing WMD proliferation and consolidating, securing, and eliminating dangerous pathogens and materials of concern. To counter current and emerging threats, like those enabled by synthetic biology and non-traditional agents, the Chemical and Biological Defense Program is developing protective equipment and detection systems for our warfighters as well as developing new strategies to anticipate, prepare, and more rapidly respond to chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats, especially in the area of, of medical countermeasures. Consistent with the U.S. Committing, uh, commitments under the CWC, we are diligently continuing our work to safely eliminate the remaining U.S. chemical weapons stockpile located in Colorado and Kentucky. This investment highlights the U.S. commitment to and importance of strengthening international norms against proliferation and use of chemical weapons. WMD threats continue to pose a clear and present danger to our way of life. Our adversaries pursue them because they believe doing so will give them significant leverage. Our job is to reduce and eliminate any advantage they may seek to gain by either making their threats impotent or convincing them of our ability and will to impose costs that will outweigh any benefit they may receive to gain by using WMD. Given that our prosperity and global stability are at stake, the importance of modernizing our nuclear deterrent cannot be overstated nor the value of our investments in developing protective equipment and medical countermeasures for our forces, who are the lethal backstop in our diplomacy. Your leadership and oversight on these issues, as well as the authorities and resources you provide us to perform these responsibilities on behalf of our nation, are vital to our collective success. So thank you again uh, for this opportunity to testify, and I certainly look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Oxford. Good morning. Chairwoman Stefanik, Ranking Member Langevin, members of the committee, it's an honor to appear before you today to address DITRA's progress and direction. It's also a privilege to appear with my colleagues here at the table. More, moreover, I'm proud to represent the 2,200 federal civilian and military members of the agency who we count on every day to consult the threats that we'll be talking about today. Our nation is faced with the most complex global threat environment we've ever faced in our history. And our, threat, our mission within DITRA to combat weapons of mass destruction, improvise threats, and to ensure a safe and, nuclear, and effective nuclear deterrent is at the nexus of our country's response to this threat as outlined in the National Security Strategy, the National Defense Strategy, and the Nuclear Posture Review. As an agency, we must adapt to be more agile to meet the, our mission obligations within the context of this threat environment. On this date, 10 months ago, I was sworn in as the director of the agency and immediately set four priorities. Restore our focus on combat support, strengthen and expand our interagency and international partnerships, and develop capabilities to address gaps in our nation's ability to prevent proliferation, deter its use, and defeat WD threats if necessary. Finally, it was most important that I empower our agency leadership and staff to meet their obligations uh, within these mission responsibilities. After taking office, I met with Secretary Madison and he reemphasized the need for us to, to restore our focus on combat support. My first priority in this regard was to establish a strong relationship with U.S. Special Operations Command and both their coordinating authority role and as a combat support agency responsible for confronting these threats uh, directly. Uh, the, I think this offers us two immediate uh, opportunities. First, we collectively can uh, accelerate the progress against this threat across DOD with our interagency partners and the international communities. And we are not bound by geographical uh, uh, distinctions, so we can actually look across the seams and gaps with the other combatant commanders to actually address the, those gaps accordingly. Uh, DITRA has made great strides in shifting its focus to ensure alignment with strategic direction 
And to this, uh, to this time, we have solicited and received operational needs from many of our combatant commanders. We've established operationally specific uh, theater support teams to accelerate progress to counter Russia, Iran, and North Korean threats. And we could, we've extended our outreach to interagency and international communities to go after these adversarial networks. In summary, we have accomplished a lot, but much remains to be done. I look forward to keeping Congress informed of our progress. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Lieutenant General Osterman. Uh, good morning. Chairman Stefanik, Ranking Member Langevin, and members of the subcommittee, thanks for the opportunity to address you today. It's an honor to be here today with ASD Rapuano, whose office is critical in providing the policy and strategic direction that guides the Department's countering weapons of mass destruction efforts as well as ASD Roberts, whose office is critical to development within our counter WMD efforts, and obviously to Mr. Oxford as well, our close partner from the Defense Threat Reduction Agency with whom our efforts are embedded and with whom we work on a daily basis. Two months ago, General Thomas testified to the House Armed Services Committee Emerging Threats and Capabilities Subcommittee. During that address, he discussed the U.S. Special Operations Command's responsibilities in our new role as DOD's coordinating authority for countering weapons of mass destruction. I'm proud to say that we've made tremendous strides in enhancing the counter WMD community of action. We've heightened the operational coordination within and between entities and developed a center dedicated to coordinating information flow and executing planning efforts, thus furthering our initial goals. The role of coordinating authority broadens SOCOM's scope of responsibility from traditional soft specific roles to a more strategic view of overall planning of DOD counter WMD efforts in support of other combatant commands, department priorities, and as directed other U.S. government agencies. We are proud to be part of that mission set. In the time since transfer of the counter WMD coordinating authority responsibility from U.S. Strategic Command, we focused on developing a campaign plan in coordination with the geographic combatant commands that emphasizes active prevention of new WMD development and preclusion of aspiring actors from attaining WMD. We have also conducted a baseline assessment to determine geographic combatant command capacity and capability shortfalls in order to establish mitigation plans. Lastly, we have built a fusion center which provides a nexus for active planning intelligence integration and assessment of progress. Continued work still remains as we finalize and continue to revise an active campaign plan. This will be accomplished by expanding and refreshing efforts to assess and understand the evolving operating environment and regularly measure how our capabilities map to these assessments. The reality is, is that the Kenner WMD mission is highly dynamic and constantly evolving, requiring unity of effort and constant vigilance. SOCOM looks forward to continued close work with OSD as well as the Joint Staff, DITRA, and the rest of the counter WMD community. The foundation of expertise they provide and the value they place on collaboration is integral to national success in countering WMD. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to address the committee this morning and look forward to your questions. Thank you to our witnesses for your opening statements. My first question is, will focus on innovation. As I referenced in my opening statement, we've seen rapid advancements in synthetic biology, gene editing, and biotechnology. How is the CWMD mission leveraging these advances in technology? Uh, I'd like to start with Mr. Rapuano for the policy piece and then uh, recognize um, uh, Mr. Oxford at DITRA for your piece of how we're tackling this. Congresswoman, thank you very much for that question. Uh, as you're well aware, uh, advanced development of biotechnology, uh, genetic engineering, uh, other capabilities such as artificial intelligence uh, very much present double-edged swords when it comes to how we look at uh, how threat actors uh, and wannabe threat actors can leverage uh, the knowledge and the ability uh, of these capabilities to develop uh, certain types of threats, uh, particularly in the bio realm, in terms of when you look at the uh, degree of dual usality of the skills and technologies, uh, but as well as the advanced information or uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, sequencing. So we do have some very important programs developed in those areas, and uh, I know that uh, my colleagues, uh, particular uh, Mr. Oxford, uh, and Mr. Roberts can speak to some of the details. Thank you. 
Mr. Oxford. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's uh, really important to understand what uh, Mr. Rapuano said. There are good and bad for all these technologies we talk about, synthetic bio, ad additive manufacturing, drone technology, um, as well as AI that I seem, to, I believe we're being outpaced in. Uh, we have uh, strong indications from the secretary on down to really up our game in machine learning as well as AI. Uh, we're working closely, uh, especially with uh, with the guidance we get from uh, Mr. Roberts' office on on SendBio. Uh, we're, we're, we've been part of a community looking at again the pros and cons of that technology. There's very positive things that can, <clears throat> excuse me, that can come out of that, but at the same time, there are nefarious ways that we need to address that. <clears throat> the way I assess this right now is there's a lot of generalized fear and uncertainty in terms of where the good and the bad are, and we need we need to get in my mind to the top ten things we really think are the nefarious use of. Send bio and start to tackle that. Um, let me ask you: Given the importance of S and T efforts, do you think our budget is adequate for S and T, Mr. Apuano? Uh, the most important element of the budget is predictability uh, for us, uh, and uh, the one thing that uh, uh, I would ask is just uh, ensuring that we we get our nineteen budget. Uh, and therefore, we can plan and operate uh, based on a known set of resources, uh, which we'll then prioritize. So obviously, in the recent budget, the department uh, has more resources the, than we've had in quite some time. And I'm confident that we'll be able to focus them on the priorities uh, as we've just laid out. Shifting gears, uh, Mr. Apuano, this question's for you as well. The work of the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program has evolved significantly since it began. Can you talk specifically about how this program can be used to address current and future threats? Uh, absolutely. It has, it has evolved considerably since uh, its initial focus on former Soviet Union states and WMD capabilities that were legacy uh, from the Soviet Union. Uh, as we look towards the future, and uh, this is something that Mr. Oxford can go into in great detail, we're really looking at this, uh, what we call left of boom, in terms of prevention of CWMD. Uh, the focus of our CTR efforts is uh, working with and developing new partnerships uh, with nations to uh, help inform uh, and equip their efforts to counter WMD, as well as the proliferation of technologies and know-how uh, that could lead to WMD capabilities. Thank you. And I wanted to give Mr. Roberts an opportunity to answer uh, my previous question on the policy yep. side. Uh, yes, I, well, I concur with Mr. Rapuano. I think our, our budget is, uh, as we submitted, uh, I support the President's budget, and I think it's adequate. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Oxford, did you want to comment on the cooperative threat reduction in terms of the left of boom moving towards that direction as we modernize the program? Absolutely. Thank you. For, well, thank you for that. On the uh, on the S and T side, I think we're adequately resourced. Uh, you know, obviously the CRs hurt, and we disrupt momentum on programs which have unintended consequences. On the CTR program, one of the first things I, I, I strove to do was to get with the combatant commanders and find out what they thought the best programs we could operate within their AORs to buy down risk. And then in consultation with, uh, with Mr. Rapuano's office, who issues the planning guidance for CTRs to work that collaboratively, make sure we're, we're actually getting the best bang for the buck. Thank you. I now recognize Mr. Langevin. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Again, thanks to our witness for your, witnesses for your testimony today. So the, uh, the chemical weapons attack on Sergei uh, Skripal uh, provides a tragic uh, test case of sorts uh, for the 2014 strategy. Uh, how are policies developed with respect to uh, the respond to crisis uh, strategic line of effort and the uh, cooperate with uh, and uh, support partners foundational activity uh, uh, dictated the department's uh, response and what specific activities is the department engaging in to assist our allies uh, and, and how is the department working with uh, the interagency to reduce incentives to employ WND by responding to Russian aggression? I'll take the first shot at that, Congressman, and thank you for the question. Uh, we are, as a whole of government, working very closely uh, with the UK, uh, as well as other partners and allies, uh, developing the response to this event. Uh, as, as you may be tracking, the advanced forensics is currently uh, being conducted by the UK. Uh, that said, it appears highly likely with the information at hand uh, that the Russians uh, are responsible. Uh, for the use of an advanced chemical agent. 
uh, against this individual. Uh, and as you note, uh, we need to uh, develop an approach that imposes high cost on this types of behavior uh, in order to deter future types of behavior, either from the Russians or others. If, uh, if, if I could add to that, uh, I was uh, privileged to be at the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons last week, in which uh, uh, several of the nations uh, and this issue had come up, and it was uh, uniformly a condemnation of Russia for what happened. So I can, uh, and both the EU and, and NATO uh, as organizations made statements to that effect. Um, and uh, as far as the, the support that the U.S. provided, we, we stood uh, made it very clear that we were willing to help them in any way that we could as far as uh, trying to track down and, and chemically analyze what was what was happening there so uh, but there was a lot of support overseas for for the efforts that we were that the Brits were undertaking thank you well I wish the president were more vocal uh, on this front as well but um, uh, as uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement the Department of Defense uh, reorganization provides both opportunity and potential risk in coordinating policies, plans, and programs across the department. Uh, historically, CWMD has been treated as uh, a specialized issue with somewhat segregated policies. Uh, Secretary Repuano uh, and Secretary Roberts, can you please describe how the Office of the Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment and uh, the Undersecretary for Policy will continue coordination to establish policies and procedures for effectively developing programs that support current CWMD goals and uh, enforce preparedness? Thank you, Congressman. I'll take a first shot at the policy piece of the equation. As I noted in my opening remarks, uh, uh, I'm the lead for the development of strategy and policy on CWMD for the Secretary. And as you note, there are many other critical functions within the Department, including AT&L, that uh, are necessary and critical to supporting our CWMD efforts. The Secretary has made very clear uh, that uh, we have got to achieve a higher unity of effort in terms of uh, how the threat has evolved and increased, uh, and the myriad capabilities and functions within the department. Uh, so we have uh, engaged from the get-go, really since I uh, came into my position, uh, working uh, with uh, Mr. Roberts, as well as Mr. Ockford, as well as with SOCOM as the coordinating authority on how we're prioritizing and how we're focusing and how we're synthesizing uh, our efforts to ensure that we are getting at the most significant threats uh, in the most effective manner possible. And I can certainly echo what Mr. Rapuano said. Uh, uh, the combating WMD policy and capability development, in my view, requires that our offices coordinate very closely. Um, and I'm happy to report to you today that uh, I think our cooperation coordination is uh, outstanding. Um, my office uh, serves as the principal point of contact in the Office of, uh, of uh, Undersecretary for Acquisition Sustainment uh, for the counter WMD issues, and we develop, uh, again, in coordination with uh, Mr. Rapuano's office uh, policies. Uh, we provide advice and we make recommendations on, among other things, the U.S. nuclear weapons, our CBRN, medical and non medical defense, our safety and security, um, chemical and biological agents. Uh, safety, surety, security, and safe destruction of the current uh, chemical weapons stockpile, and nuclear, chemical, and biological arms control activities. Um, and so uh, I think that relationship will grow stronger over time as we continue to look to other agencies within DOD that also have a role to play in this area. Thank you. Thank you. I'll have additional questions. I don't know if we're going to go to the second round, but uh, thank you all for your testimony, and I'll get back. Ms. Cheney. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Stefanik, and thank you very much to all of our witnesses for being here today. Um, Lieutenant General Osterman, um, my question is for you, my first question. Um, we, in your testimony, you, you talked about the need for uh, exquisite access, and you began to sort of discuss, I think, the extent to which we're trying to get information in, in what are very difficult and challenging areas, um, some of the most difficult, I think, in which we operate and the most opaque. Uh, but could you, to the extent that you can, uh, in open setting. Um, talk about uh, why you think what we're doing now is going to be more effective in that regard, um, in particular in areas connected to nonproliferation. And I understand there are other, other responsibilities and other offices for that. But, but as you look at things like the North Korea threat, 
Uh, and I'm not talking about whether or not we have to take military action there, but but looking at nonproliferation issues there. Um, how you feel we're we're in a better position today to be able to ensure that we actually know what's happening uh, with with those nuclear materials and and others in other rogue states. Uh, Congresswoman, thank you for the question. The uh, I think probably fundamental to that is uh, in our efforts with counter WMD, we're tied very closely to the national defense strategy. So the clear articulation in terms of the prioritization and, and how our national defense uh, strategy is constructed has been of great utility for us in that regard. Uh, in terms of apportionment of assets of uh, mostly as you're referring to the exquisite capability is associated with intelligence apparatus in order to uh, have information that we need in order to uh, conduct the missions not only in a planning context but also a tactical context. So I would uh, say that I, I do believe that uh, there has been a significant change uh, with the emphasis in those uh, hard problem sets and in the peer competitor range that allow us then to open up that planning beyond just the counter VEO mission that we had typically focused on, you know, with our previous mission sets, and then uh, open that aperture to allow us to look at some of these harder ones that really require a whole of government approach, and then allow us to continue with our interagency coordination to achieve that. And you also talked about, um, in, in a pre-crisis scenario, the extent to which other agencies have responsibilities. Um, could could you define sort of uh, what what uh, would constitute crisis? How we would determine that that um, you all are now uh, have, carrying the responsibility in terms of these issues? How that responsibility has shifted from other agencies? Uh, Congressman, I guess I would define that as uh, pre-crisis being short of conflict, active and open conflict, which is where then as Department of Defense, and I'd really refer this more towards the policy uh, folks, but it's it's where we would, you know, DOD would then look to take on primacy rather than a supporting effort. So right now, our counter WMD effort as a coordinating authority is really how best to orchestrate the Department of Defense activities in that pre-crisis phase to support uh, the other interagency and intelligence community um, organizations that are associated with looking at the problem set and, and uh, working with it you know, from a deterrence perspective uh, and counterproliferation perspective. That shift being then once it crosses the line, I think, into active and open conflict. Thank you. And I'll have additional questions in the closed setting, but I'll yield back now. Mr. Larson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Oxford, uh, hello again. Uh, so I have a question um, about the turnaround time that DITRA has when you get uh, a COCOM request and then you prototype and develop and produce. Um, do you, uh, are you using a separate process outside of acquisition uh, or not? And then is there anything that you need to change or we need to consider changing within that process that you use to increase that turnaround or to shorten that turnaround time? So, so uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. And, and clearly, it depends on the complexity of the problem that we've been asked to resolve in some cases. And we can talk about this a little bit more in the closed session. We get a, we get a quick operational requirement. We've been known to turn, turn back in 12 days. Uh, that's, that's to provide limited numbers of capabilities. But in many cases, we're looking at that two to three time, year time period. Uh, we, ha we have a lot of uh, uh, requirements from Under Secretary Lord right now to make sure we are looking at every every contracting vehicle possible as opposed to what have become kind of the traditional contracting vehicles people have used. So we're standing up actually an innovation office within the, within the agency to look at these various levels of complexity of the problem and what the right uh, appro appropriate contracting vehicle is to get after that problem. So the, the turn cycle will be predicated on the complexity and the vehicle that we can use to do that. But I, I will tell you, as an agency, we, we became too traditional in some of our contracting, and we are, we are opening the lens to this innovation board, bringing in new contracting officers to get the problems uh, in, a, in a more holistic way and, and with a lot more innovation. Yeah. Uh, you're bringing in new contracting officers from other uh, agencies within DOD, or you mean you're hiring additional? We're, we're going to go out and hire new people. Uh, the Undersecretary has told us to make sure all of our contracting officers are trained in other transactional authorities, 
mm. is something that she is very akin to. We have people that are using OTAs at this point in time, mm -hmm. but it's going to be a bigger part of our future as we look across the cons consortiums that have been established elsewhere by DIU DIUX and others to make use of the OTAs they already have in place because we can rapidly get things on the contract that way. Yeah, and uh, I know you said you could cover some other things in our closed session as well. Yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, Mr. Roberts, I, th is, I think this is for you, um, but it's about the proliferation security initiative. Would that be a question for you or Mr. Rapuano? Okay, great. Uh, well, then, then you're off the hook. Um, uh, is a PSI still helping to prevent WD proliferation, and are there any changes that uh, the administration is pursuing to it to um, improve upon any changes that you think are necessary? Absolutely it is, and really the driving purpose of PSI is to uh, shape the environment in terms of uh, partners, allies, the international community with regard to the importance uh, as well as the how-tos associated with enforcing UN Security Council sanctions with regard to proliferation. Uh, obviously very active in terms of that education process and that consensus building process in supporting the maximum pressure campaign against North Korea. Yeah, and um, is it, uh, the, um, are our partners in PSI still then willing to utilize their own, uh, are you getting, hearing any reluctance from partners to utilize their own laws, their own rules their, um, to, in order to implement the PSI? So the actual coordination of activities uh, really falls into other categories beyond PSI. Mm. PSI is more about the engagement, the education, the consensus building. But yeah. in terms of specific actions, those are handled in a variety of different ways that, that we can speak to in more detail in the closed hearing. Great, thanks. Um, and then I think might, this might be for Mr. Oxford as well, but um, whoever can answer that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, so there appears to be some overlap in our capabilities of medical countermeasures between the DOD and, and uh, HHS, our manufacturing capabilities. Is it, is it necessary that DOD have independent manufacturing capabilities for medical countermeasures, or is there some efficiencies that we can explore? So, so if I could, uh, there's, all, there's always interagency strife, as you may know, but uh, this we actually follow suit as a performer through uh, Mr. Roberts' office, so they, they handle the prioritization of the priority of, of what we're tasked to do. If I could uh, comment on that, uh, yeah. we have, in fact, uh, established, uh, you may be familiar with it, uh, a medical countermeasures platform uh, within um, what we've uh, established as the Advanced Development and Manufacturing Center uh, in, um, in Florida. Mm. And this is a facility that is uh, contract operated, contract owned, but we provided the equipment that helps us uh, in uh, different circumstances rapidly develop vaccines for the warfighter. Uh, and also uh, over agents that uh, uh, would not be normally uh, profitable for big pharma, big mm. uh, pharmaceuticals to run. So this is a, a new innovative thing. It's up and running, um, and it provides us a, a, a capability that isn't in the, com in the civilian community. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Time's expired. We'll now move to round two of questions and then break for the closed session. Um, so my second question I want to direct first at SOCOM and then at DITRA. Um, given the increased threat of chemical and biological agents, what is our ability to operate in and through a contaminated environment? Do we have equipment or readiness concerns? Uh, I want to ask that question broadly, and then I want to ask that question specifically with the North Korea threat. Uh, Chairman, uh, we, uh, we do have the ability to operate in those environments, and uh, we've uh, continued, and matter of fact, are enhancing training uh, throughout DOD in the sense of being able to operate in those environments, given the emerging and uh, more prevalent threats, I think, than what we've had perhaps in the past. We've always had that capability, and for example, even uh, in the Iraq-Syria mission sets where we've had chemicals used and everything, we've been able to respond to those uh, very adequately with the proper protection, proper uh, forces in order to be able to work with it from an EOD perspective. Some of the specifics associated with North Korea, I'd prefer to wait until the closed session if we could, and I'll be prepared to answer them. Thank you. Mr. Oxford? 
Thank you. And uh, again, uh, more details in the, in the closed session if we could. But uh, I will say that uh, after 17 years of the counterterrorism fight, we're finding a lot of things that we used to do with the big general purpose forces that are, is under stress. And so as we look at a North Korean or other engagements against those threats that are identified in the national defense strategy, it, it, we need to rebalance the force. I think Secretary Mattis would say getting back to preparedness and then modernization would be his top two priorities. Thank you. Shifting gears, Mr. Roberts, your office oversees the chemical demilitarization program. Can you update us on how this work is progressing? We understand there have been some contract issues. Uh, yes. Um, well, our biggest challenge, first of all, we have, uh, as you know, two facilities, one in Pueblo, Colorado, and the other in Bluegrass uh, in Kentucky. And uh, our biggest challenge is right now the, um, well, the, the bluegrass facility is not up and running yet. It won't be until next, next year. Uh, and the Pueblo facility, there uh, we've had uh, some problems uh, with the throughput, throughput, if you will, of the um, neutralization and hydrolysate treatment process. Um, as a result, we haven't uh, actually been dismantling and destroying the munitions uh, since um, last August. Uh, we're hoping that the facility would be up and running uh, by July. And uh, as it stands right now, uh, given all the other things that we're doing, working very closely with the contractor, we still believe we'll be able to meet the uh, December 31, 2023 20, deadline. Thank you. And my last question is for Mr. Oxford. Um, which has to do with rapid development and fielding. What has DITRA learned from JIDO's rapid delivery, capability delivery? So, so I think the biggest uh, biggest issue is to really understand the operational requirements. And uh, we created one of the strategic imperatives within the, within the agency when I took over. We call it attack the network, and it gets to w uh, one of the uh, questions that uh, Congress, Congresswoman Cheney asked as well. Really illuminating the entire network and identifying through ops intel analysis how do you get to the solution space allows us to more rapidly turn within some of the questions that Mr. Larson was also asking to take the ability to tailor the response, identify in many cases commercial capabilities as opposed to developing, developing them within the department, which has been kind of the traditional approach, but then having the adequate test and evaluation process that's tailored again to the complexity of the problem as opposed to what the DOD 5000 series would suggest as a T&E problem. Is, is to actually tailor to the rapid response, again, based on the complexity and what Ops Intel tells us the capability needs to be. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Langevin, you recognized for a second round of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, again, thanks to all of our witnesses. Uh, to sort of follow up and continue in this uh, line of questioning, Director Oxford, uh, how is uh, DITRA uh, coordinating S&T and R&D with the Undersecretary for Research and Engineering community, uh, which includes uh, DARPA and the, uh, the labs? A couple of things there, especially on the latter part of that, Mr. Langevin. The, uh, I, have an, I have a working agreement now with Steve Walker, the director of DARPA. Uh, he sent his entire senior staff along with himself to the agency, and we spent half a day with his entire organization. We are now a transition partner for many of the capabilities that he gets to a certain phase, and we take them on and, and get them matured and into the field. We, we actually showed the undersecretary uh, some of those uh, yesterday. Uh, regarding the national labs, I, I hosted uh, 10 national labs at the agency recently and talked about a path forward where we will now quarterly meet with the labs, identify capabilities that match against our priorities, and then figure out working with the DOE leadership and the NNSA leadership how to gain access to those laboratories in a way that meets those uh, the, the solution space. Uh, my head of research and development is actually a member of the uh, executive committee under Mr. Griffin over in R&E, so he meets with his seniors on a quarterly basis as well. So we, even though Mr. Griffin's only been in office for a short while, we have a direct connectivity into his chain. Thank you. So uh, I believe that a whole of government effort is, is required to support CWMD strategy and policy. Can you please describe uh, all of your, your work with other agencies to achieve your strategic CWMD uh, objectives, and how is uh, under-resourcing and marginal ma marginalizing uh, of other federal agencies, such as the Department of State, affected the CWMD effort? Uh, to your point, uh, uh, Congressman, uh, it truly is a whole-of-government effort. When you look at, uh, particularly in the uh, acquisition, the capability development on the part of adversaries or potential adversaries, uh, many of those uh, interdictions, many of those interventions and efforts to, to get at uh, the pathways, we call, 
in terms of the routes for individuals or non-state actors or act state actors to develop capability are getting at the diplomatic piece of it, the arms control, a compliance piece of it, the uh, economic sanctions. Uh, we have the Treasury, Department of Commerce, DHS, in terms of all of the export control issues involved. We meet on a constant basis with them, routinely, uh, weekly, in terms of at the White House and the PCC, uh, at other interagency constructs that we can speak in more detail in closed session. But it truly is a very well uh, integrated effort in terms of all the different players. Yeah, but I don't want to hear just the, the good news stories. I just want to see how is the under-resourcing and the marginalizing of other federal agencies such as Department of State uh, affected the CWMD effort? Uh, Congressman, I, I can't speak to the budget circumstances of, of other agencies. I would simply note that the cooperation uh, is, is ongoing and very strong. Mr. Landerman, if I could address that. Uh, General Osterman and I had a chance to meet in two consecutive weeks, uh, first with uh, CENTCOM in an interagency meeting to talk about uh, specific threats. And again, we can talk about that in the closed session. Uh, the, the challenge for the department, is, as General Osterman said, is illuminating the network so we can get the interagency involved in getting after the threats within their authorities as opposed to becoming a DOD-only problem. We met a week later under, uh, under uh, General Thomas's leadership at a global synchronization conference where, once again, we reemphasized the need for the interagency to be involved left, left of the problem. And what, what the burden is on many of those other interagency partners is lack of analytical capabilities and lack of information that DOD often has, but we haven't always shared. So getting to a better information sharing further enables the, the small analytical capabilities they have in some of the agencies that Mr. Rapawana mentioned. Very good. Thank you. Um, so it, uh, it, as Lieutenant General Osterman noted in his testimony, there's a lack of, of clear tasks for CWMD. How are each of you working uh, to bring clarity to CWMD roles and uh, responsibilities, tasks, as well as policies and programs so that CWMD efforts are well understood across the DOD and combatant commands? Uh, I'll, I'll take a first knock at that, uh, Congressman. The first thing we, we are focused on doing is prioritization. Uh, all, all WMD is not equal. Uh, and all WMD is not equally uh, interdictable in the sense of when we look at the different pathways and means of acquisition of different actors, we, we need to be and are uh, prioritizing who the actors that represent the biggest risk and threat and therefore what pathways and activities we're going to focus on and then identifying those agencies with the information uh, authorities and capabilities necessary to work either independently or in tandem with others to most effectively uh, get at uh, that acquisition and deny it. And if I could add, uh, we, we continue to work with the services and the Joint Requirements Office uh, to align, assess, align uh, resources to address any of the capability gaps. Uh, joint staff then identifies future operational capability needs uh, with input from the services. And we, we arrive at uh, a, what would be called a joint priority list, which identifies and prioritizes uh, those capabilities. And then we continue to be in close collaboration with the end users. And I think that process as overarching uh, allows us to, uh, you know, effectively identify the priorities that need to be addressed uh, in, in an order of priority. Thank you. Uh, sir, I can jump on that as well. Just two very quick things. One is a... Uh, developing a functional campaign plan, which uh, SOCOM has done, and which uh, harmonizes and coordinates all those activities, also identifies gaps through the assessment process. And then the other one is the creation of our fusion center, which allows for the integration of planning, as well as uh, resources, threat analysis, and even operational activity. Thank you all. I know my time has expired, so I'll yield back. Thank you all. Thank you. This concludes our open session. We will now transition for the closed portion of this hearing.